This is the Real Estate Investing 365 Podcast, your go-to source for real estate investing strategies so you can start living the life you want and get where you want to go with your host, Justin Hanna. Welcome back, everybody. Another episode of Real Estate Investing 365. I'm here with my buddy, John Scholler. He's from West Virginia. He's got a bunch of things going on, a gym, real estate business. Um, he had a moving company at one time. He's just a busy man. What's up, John? Thanks for being here. What's up, Justin? Thanks for having me on. Yeah, absolutely, man. I'm excited to kind of tell your story. And, you know, you're a younger guy. At least we both like to think we're still younger. But, to, you know, it's funny. I talked to like my son that's 12 and he says, you're old, you're so old and you're 32 and you know, I'm 32. I'm like, God damn, you know, I don't feel that old. But anyways, you're a younger guy, I would say, and uh, you've done a lot of stuff. So i um, excited to get into that. So why don't you give us a little bit of background of who you are, where you came from, and then uh, we'll move into the real estate business in a minute. All right, perfect. What always gets me on the age thing is when you uh, look at when you graduated high school. That's oh. when it's like, oh man, it's been that long since I haven't been in school. Like Horrible. I've been out of school longer yeah. than I've been in school. So yeah. that does make me feel a little bit older. <laughs> man, now my son's 12 and he's going to the same middle school I went to. Yeah. We haven't moved yet. And now I'm going back and, you know, seeing the teachers there and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm in middle school with my son. <laughs> <laughs> the same That's school, funny. same classroom. <laughs> Well, anyway, like you said, uh, my name is John Scholler. For any of those who don't know me, which I'm sure is just about all of you, and uh, I'm a real estate investor here in Charleston, West Virginia. I own several businesses. I've always been an entrepreneur. I've owned businesses since I was 21 years old, now 33. So I guess uh, about 12, 13 years now going on that I've owned businesses uh, in some form or fashion, either through a sole proprietor or a partnership as an investor. In some way, shape, or form, I've been involved in probably... I don't know, close to 10 businesses now. All right. So, and so when you're 21 years old, I, I kind of want to dive into your first business because that kind of goes to show what kind of type of person you are. You kind of, we talked about it originally um, when we spoke on the phone and it was like some sort of a moving company, right? Right, right. So uh, you want me to kind of tell that story and how Just I Just kind of tell that, that story because yeah, it's kind of a good example of like how most business owners kind of suck, right? And if you got a little bit of hustle, it's a great opportunity for all of us. Right. So I guess uh, I was trying to force a, a square peg in a round hole and I was trying to go to college and, and I graduated high school with like a 2.2, 2. 2. Uh, 2. It was all, it was bad. Yeah. And it wasn't because I was necessarily stupid. I wasn't interested. Uh, if you follow Gary Vaynerchuk, he talks a lot about this stuff. He sucked at school too, but it, it just didn't keep my attention. I didn't care anything about chemistry. I didn't care anything about trigonometry or Spanish too. It just didn't hold my interest. And I was very hyperactive and I just cared more about making other people in class laugh or whatever. So I got out of high school. All my friends went off to college and I started having FOMO. So I enrolled at the local community college, the only college that would have me. And I started taking business classes and um, I had to take other classes as well. If you're going to take businesses, you had to take like psychology and something else. I was failing all of my classes that weren't business. Business, I was getting like 100, 110 on my test. It just was easy to me. But all the other classes like psych psychology, I was failing. Like it wasn't even like getting bad grades. Like it was like, you should probably just not come to this class. Anymore. <laughs> well, anyway, I, I, I can't honestly say that I was always meant thought I was going to be an entrepreneur, not since like a young teenager, but I knew that I didn't do well with authority or do well with regular jobs with people over me. I always thought I either knew a better way or a more efficient way to do something. And I didn't want you to tell me how to do that. Mm -hmm. Not that I knew everything. It just was, uh, it's hard for me to take others leadership and get an hourly wage for it. Nothing wrong with those that can do that. Yeah. Right. But anyway, I was working for a company at the time that did uh, subcontracting for big box stores. Like here, I'm sure you have them there, like big lots and Lowe's and stuff like that. These places that sell big furniture that don't have delivery. Right. So they would get big, they would get box trucks and go to these stores and say, Hey, we'll deliver your furniture for you. And the customer can just pay us directly or pay you. And then you pay us, whatever. So they weren't very good at business ownership. It was a great idea, but they weren't very good at business ownership. They had never owned a business before. And basically to speed this up, they got several months behind on paying me. I was pretty much running the business anyway. They went on vacation for about a week and a half. They got back. They still haven't paid me. And they wanted to complain out of like 87 deliveries. I missed one. 
And I was like, all right, so you guys aren't going to pay me and complain when I pretty much ran this thing while you were on vacation. <laughs> right. so I was in business class, couldn't remember. And I just quit. I just quit that because I had an opportunity. And I will say that, like, I do believe that entrepreneurship or getting lucky or business and success, there is a slight bit of luck, right? But I do still believe, I think it was Zig Ziglar said, is uh, um, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. Exactly, yeah. So what happened was I, I had been building these skill sets running this company and they weren't doing well for the company, the businesses they were working for either. And I walked in there and the lady was like, look, it was one of the big contracts. I said, look, John, you've been pretty much running this thing in, anyway. All the clients love you. We love you. We don't like working for them. We're going to fire them anyway. So if you go get your own truck, we'll give you the whole contract. This contract was huge. It was uh, $60. It was called Mattress King. It was $60 a delivery, and I could do 10 to 15 deliveries a day. Dang. So if you do the math, it's pretty good money. Yeah. Borrowed five grand from a buddy of mine who had uh, saved up some money, ran to Pennsylvania like that next day and got a truck, drove it all the way back. To, they had all this storage <laughs> stuff in the truck. I ripped all that out. Uh-huh. I showed up to the store. I showed up, loaded up with all the mattresses. Then the, then the business as I w- was working for showed up 45 minutes late. I was already loaded up and leaving. <laughs> and I just kind of wait. I just kind of waved at him. I didn't know what else to do. It was really awkward. Yeah. I was loading really fast because it'd be awkward. So anyway, that grew, that grew. It exploded. I ended up getting about ten to twelve contracts with multiple stores, bigger stores, uh, Lowe's, a bunch of furniture stores, Pier One. One second. <coughs> I'm sick, so I'm getting over a little bit of a cold. Yeah, no problem. <coughs> So anyway, I was doing these deliveries and I lived in a big college town. I was in Charlottesville, Virginia. And when I would do these deliveries, the college kids would say, hey, do you move stuff too? Because I got some furniture and if you move it across the hall down the street from me, I'll give you a few hundred bucks. And I was like, wait, that only took me like an hour. You just paid me $250. Right. So I did the math and I said, I need to be moving too. So I was on Craigslist before anybody else was on Craigslist. This was like a decade ago, over a decade ago, and I had no competition. So I started advertising on Craigslist that I'll do moving. The moving exploded. That was way better than deliveries. I still did the deliveries as well on the side now, but the moving was a full-time thing. And I grew it for about eight to nine years. I was not the biggest, but I was the number one ranked moving company in Charlottesville, Virginia. Ended up selling it to a friend before my wife and I went and did travel nursing for a few years as she's a nurse. Yeah, that's awesome. What a great story. (laughs) It goes to show like, exactly like entrepreneurship isn't just about skill, but it has a little bit of luck, but I don't know. I kind of wanted to really believe that as long as you like get good and proficient in a job and you have the mindset to, that you want to progress, those opportunities are guaranteed pretty much to like present themselves. So I don't know if I call it luck. I just call it like, you're good at what you do and you're a go-getter and you hustle. So good things are going to happen. You know what I mean? Right. So that's cool. And then you went on a little trip with your wife, right? For a couple of years, you, went, <laughs> you were able to financially afford to like go and go with her and travel kind of around. She's a traveling nurse. And then you end up moving back to West Virginia, where you're from? Yes. Yeah, so we went all over California, like I told you. Then we went to Maui for three months. And then we uh, backpacked through Thailand uh, and Europe, uh, two, two different backpacking trips. And then she, we got uh, an assignment in, in Northern Virginia. Okay. So Washington, D.C. area. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we lived right over the line in Maryland. And while we were there, she had applied to nurse anesthesia school uh, at a few schools, and Marshall University accepted her here in Charleston, West Virginia. I apologize. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> I guess you'll just edit this out. No, uh, no problem. I just let <laughs> it run, buddy. <laughs> I apologize, man. I just trying to – I thought I was good. I didn't cough all morning. Now I'm on here, I guess, because I'm talking a lot. Oh, yeah, no problem. So anyway, she got accepted here uh, to nursing anesthesia school. It's a doctorate's program. It's a three-year program. And we didn't know anything about this area. In fact, West Virginia, we thought, was the last place we'd ever end up. So we moved here. But before moving here, I started researching real estate investors. This whole time we had off, the two years or so we were traveling around while she was doing nursing, I was researching real estate and investing. And I knew that with the money I had saved up, I could do something. Couldn't do something in Maui. It was way too expensive. Yeah. Or I was also, LA was too expensive and so was Palo Alto. But I knew I'd eventually find somewhere to invest. And we landed here. I had already researched the area and I knew of, a, of a, two partners uh, that had a company here that were already investing. And so I reached out to them and said, look, I just want to sit down with you guys 
and see if I can link up with you guys and y'all just show me the ropes. And they were like, sure. So I met up with Andrew and I said, all right, can I come shadow you uh, next week? And he said, absolutely. Well, this is a crazy story and you don't have enough time on this podcast for it, but yeah. fast forward, I am now partners with Andrew and Steve. We've been together for two and a half years and I'm now CEO in the company. Uh, and we flipped over a hundred homes together. All right. Sweet. So, um, you might've said in the beginning, but you're not from West Virginia. You're I'm from not. Virginia. Charlottesville, 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 Virginia, yeah. Virginia. Right. You know, I'm not very good on my little <laughs> geography in that area. So <laughs> I was like, West Virginia, Charlotte is, I don't know where that is. Anyways. Okay. So did you know anybody before you got into and met your partners here? Did you know anybody before that that was into real estate or how did you kind of get the spark of the idea that, listen, like I kind of want to get into real estate because you were in a moving company. That was nothing. I mean, you were moving people, but how did you kind of get that idea? Well, I think it's one thing leads to another with that. So I was in the moving company and I'm very frugal. I was saving every dollar. Like I was, I was frugal to the most people would call it cheap. I now accept that in my younger days, I was definitely cheap. Now yeah. I'm frugal. Yeah. But we say I was saving every dollar and I, I amassed amount of, uh, a nice amount of money for my age. And I should, naturally you start Googling what in the world can I do with this money? Right. Well, I started Googling that too late. I, I could kick myself for all the money I had sitting for as long as I did because I lost a lot of money. I didn't lose a lot. I lost the opportunity to make a lot of money. Opportunity cost, yeah. Yes, right. So when you start Googling what to do with money, real estate's always like number one, number two, or number three. It's in, it's, it's in there somewhere, usually yeah. number one, of what to start, how to start investing your money. So that naturally leads you to bigger pockets, which everybody knows about. Yeah. Get in the bigger pockets, start watching the podcast. And I said, wait a minute. I thought that only multimillionaires and, and uh, rich people could do this. You're telling me anybody could do this or people with the amount of money I have saved or people with like little to no money? Why didn't I know this earlier? Yeah. So I don't, I don't come from background of money. I, my, none of my family has money. Or I guess that's a, a, an extreme exaggeration. None of my family is wealthy. I don't say they're all like dirt poor on the street, but none right. of them, none of them are, are wealthy or have ever showed me how to invest or anything like that. I had to learn it all myself. I, fig I figured out how to make money and save money on my own, but I did not know what to do with it. So I started Googling it and that's when it got me into bigger pockets and uh, the millionaire next door and just started reading books. Books really introduced me into real estate. And then I found Grant Cardone, of course. And then I was like, all right, I got to get into this. And I just started looking mistakenly a little bit maybe i started looking for and depending depending too much on a mentor or finding a mentor before getting started i think i wanted handheld uh and i guess i end up did finding that with andrew and steve even though they're my partners now uh but i wish i would have just taken action a little bit sooner right and just get going i mean yeah. you got to educate yourself but at a certain point you know you got to like stop reading so much and just like make it happen because there's nothing like, you know, real world, world experience. You can watch YouTube videos building the house, but unless you actually swung the hammer, you're not really going to know how to do it. Right. So yeah, those books aren't writing checks. <laughs> That's true. I wish they would, man. That'd be sweet. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> okay, cool. So there's, there's hundreds of different ways to make money in real estate. And like, you know, the basic, most ways people have it. I mean, I would say is like long-term buy and holds or fix and flip. And or wholesaling, like those are the the three basic, I guess, like real estate investing strategies. Um, you you have a couple rentals, right? Like rental properties, but your main um, source of real estate business is the wholesaling company, correct? Flipping. Uh, flipping. Oh, right. okay. So oh, yeah. <laughs> why did you? So what made you stick on? You know, after reading Bigger Pockets and everything, especially since you didn't know anything, a lot of people would just choose like, okay, I'm going to buy a house, I'm going to turn it into a rental, and then I'm going to slowly over time do more and more. What made you choose like the flipping route? So the Bigger Pockets, obviously, yeah, they definitely want to steer you into the Burr strategy, right? Which is perfect. It's awesome. I'm not talking bad about it, but it wasn't the opportunity that was presented to me. My partners that I met, keep in mind, they're already doing this for a couple of years before I joined in with them we're flipping. So I naturally just started flipping because that's what they were doing. And we also have uh, ANC properties, which is another company where we have over a hundred homes and rent to own. So that's still not rental in the uh, traditional sense, but it is our holding company where we do have those homes. Uh, we're just rent to owning them. And then we have probably about six or seven rentals, which were just straight up failed flips. They just didn't flip in time. And so we had to rent them to build that equity in them and get the cash flow back to get the investor square again and to maybe make some money on them. 
Uh, we could have cut our losses on them, I guess, but we, uh, we had the opportunity with our investor. He is, a, I won't say he doesn't care. We're very fortunate enough that he's very lenient. He doesn't, he just like, okay, just get me even again. I, I, that's all I care about. It doesn't matter how long it takes on these ones, as long as the majority make me money. And so that's how he looks at it. And we're fortunate for that. Okay. So the property, the rental properties that you have, um, you're paying the cash flow back to the investor that invested with you guys. Not even so in, in a way. So basically they're just, uh, the cat, all the cash flow is going to an account for that house and building up a substantial amount of money that we can either bring to the table on the failed flip if we need to, or, uh, be, yeah, that's essentially what it is. Either bring it to the table at, or, or just keep it so that it's not losing money. So if it's just sitting there and nobody's running it, it's losing money. Uh, we don't pay our investors a percentage or this investor anyway. He's just a uh, one third profit share. So mm -hmm. there's, it's not costing us anything like uh, hard money, mm -hmm. but if it's just sitting there, it would cost us money. So this cash flow will do a couple of things. It'll get us a substantial amount of money back in a year, say twelve, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 that we now have to either go ahead and sell the house and give the investor the money back. And there might be a little bit left over there. Right. Okay. So normally I would kind of dive into like how you got started exactly. Like, okay, like how did you, what, what was your first deal that you did? But you kind of like met your partners there and they were kind of already doing it. And then you, you know, worked your way into the business probably obviously cause you have a good business background and um, your financial knowledge is good and everything. So um, I guess what we, what, what we could, what would be beneficial to talk about is how you ended up, uh, how you ended up meeting your partners, you know, and then how somebody could go about, you know, maybe meeting partners or meeting, finding people in their local area um, that can guide them in the right direction. So how, how did it work out for you? So like I said, when we were in uh, West Virginia, uh, sorry, Washington, DC at the time, she had gotten accepted here, but we haven't moved here. I'm already researching the area. So that's, first of all, do your research, look up people that are doing what you want to do and contact them. They are eager to teach usually like I am. Mm -hmm. Someone reaches out to me, I'm quick to have a lunch with you or go meet with you or show you what I'm doing. I love to mentor people. I, I just love to educate. In yeah. fact, that's what my entire Instagram is about. But go reach out to these people. They're not going to, they, look, your situation is not going to end like mine. Mine's a little bit weird where I end up being partner with them, but I brought a lot to the table. And that's another thing. Don't go meet with these people empty handed. Say, what can I do for you? And don't expect anything. So mm -hmm. maybe you have, maybe you have some social media background. Maybe you know how to run a podcast. Maybe you know how to market. Maybe you know where some hidden deals are. Bring those to the table for these people and just give them to them. And they will in return mentor you. Not mm -hmm. all the time. Some people out there are just in it for themselves, but it's very rare. So bring that stuff to the table and be, what can I do for you instead of what can you do for me attitude will be huge. So for my partners, I tell a story all the time uh, for people who think that I just kind of fell into this. That's not the truth. Look, my partners needed me just as much as I needed them in that moment in time. And so it worked out for all of us. But the very first day I was there, they didn't know how much money I had. Nobody did. I just came into shadow. But I sat down at the, the table. I listened to everybody talk. I listened, I listened, I listened. And there's nothing I could really help with because remember, I didn't have a real estate background yet. Um, and I couldn't just start making like CFO moves yet because right. I'm just literally sitting, I can't believe, no, don't do that with your money. Do this. Cause I don't know everything yet. But one thing that they were complaining about was they just got the new office and they were saying the bathroom's a wreck. The bathroom's a wreck and we don't have toilet paper. The bathroom's all dirty. So the next day I came in before the office opened, before everybody got there, I knew the secretary came in earlier than they did. I cleaned, I didn't say a thing. I cleaned the whole bathroom and stocked it with toilet paper out of my own money. Right. It wasn't a big expense, but 15 bucks for some air fresheners and some toilet paper. And I went and sat down in the office. They came in and I, and I know to this day that was huge for them because they were like, wait a minute, this guy doesn't work for us. He's not on payroll. He's just shadowing. And he came in and cleaned our bathroom and stocked it with toilet paper. I know this is a super strange thing for a lot of listeners, but really think about this. I gave, I showed them what I would do with a bathroom. Imagine what I'll bring when I'm, when I'm talking about the business and when there's money involved and when there's pay involved. And I think that that helped spark and help them go, Oh, wait a minute. This dude's legit. Like he's not just here to soak up knowledge from us. He wants to also give. Yeah, no, definitely. That's, that's a huge key. And that's, it's, it's kind of the same thing. It's like customer service, right? Even though um, they're not your customer and you're hoping to learn from them and everything, but you're trying to like give to the other person, you know, I kind of, I kind of learned that from my parents. They own an auto shop when I was growing up small, mom and pop auto shop. 
But what they did is every single car that got washed and every, and they would vacuum out all the cars after they got done with it. And they would offer to go, you know, they would go pick up the customer's car from their house. They would deliver the car back to their house with, with the bill or whatever they needed, like anything they could do to make it out, go out extra easy for the people. They, sometimes they would bring like the little old ladies to the grocery store while their car, my mom would, was getting worked on. And, you know, so it just made the, the whole experience much easier. And so for you, kind of the same thing. You recognize that they had a need and you're like, man, I want to get in there, but also you want to help them. So you help them and they're like, man, this guy's a rock star. So, um, I'm sure that's, they, they recognize that and they said, Hey, you know, continue to work with us, continue to shadow us and everything. And so that's cool. So you clean the bathroom, you keep shadowing them. Um, how did it kind of transpire from there? Like, how did you end up being, um, working for them and then move into more of a, uh, the role that you're in now? So they, it got a little awkward in the beginning because I could never, I I could never, it'd be really hard for me to go work for somebody anymore. Mm-hmm. So I quickly made it clear, like, look, guys, I'm not going to be for hire. Uh, I know that's awkward because you guys are already partners and I'm not expecting you guys to bring me on as partner. Um, but we'll just see where this goes. And it just kind of was weird how I just kind of worked that way until one day we were, I think it was like eight or nine months in when we were like, we're all third partners now, right? Like we've, of the amount of work we've done, how much we had to do uh, to uh, get to this place and to work our way out of the, of the little situation we were in. We've got a lot of sweat equity in this and we were all agreed. Okay, look, we're all into this together. And now still today on paper, actually, it's Andrew and Steve and then me, John Scholler Consulting, uh, as a kind of like um, as a partnership. But if anybody asks at the website, if it, we're partners for right. all intents and purposes. It's just for tax reasons because they were already going together. Uh, it would have been difficult for me to slide in there. It's just right. more beneficial to me actually to do this because I'm also an investor in the company. Okay. So the way we flip houses, uh, we bring in outside money, we buy the house, we manage it, flip it, and give the investor back a third of profit or 8 to 10% ROI, depending on which option. But I'm also one of those investors. So just to, from a tax advantage standpoint, it really works out for me to go this, go this route. But yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it was just that we just all needed each other at the exact right time. But I think that if, if I didn't, if that wasn't the case, they would have still allowed me um, and probably handheld me through my first couple of deals. And I still would be doing something similar, not to scale, not to the scale. These guys are like, uh, always on the gas pedal. Yeah. It's a, it's a pro and a con, but it's a pro for growing a business. I'm the, we always joke in the company, I'm the seatbelt and, and they're, <laughs> they're the car and yeah. you need both. You definitely need both. And so that's, I'm, I'm more financially savvy than they are. And they're more uh, growth oriented than I am. We always joke and pick on each other. But yeah. That's no. how we can fit together. That's a perfect, perfect combo for sure. You know, the, right. the, the yin and the yang, but it, it works out. So, um, so let's talk about the business a little bit. How do you guys go about finding the properties? First of all, do you guys do direct mail, cold calling, or, you know, what's, what's that kind of look like for somebody if they wanted to get into the same type of business? What's, how do you do it and how could they, somebody new do it? So how we do it probably won't work for every market. I would say that cold calling and direct mail and door knocking is where you need to start in any market pretty much. But where we're at is we kind of started that way and with the bandit signs, putting the signs out, we buy houses. But now we're like, uh, we have a pretty big Facebook following and we're in a pretty small market. Uh, But we have about 12,000 Facebook followers in our area. And so now we're pretty much the go-to if you want to sell your house for cash. We have a few uh, people that are are a competition. We probably have maybe two other people, three other people that are serious. But in the Charleston area, the Canal and Putnam areas where we operate, we're definitely the largest. Uh, we may be, we haven't, we haven't checked this and I don't know if there's a way to, but we may be the largest flipper in our state. We're not sure yet. Uh, we do about 30 to 40 houses a year. Um, but in West Virginia, that's, that's pretty substantial. But what we do now is people message the Facebook page or they message our website or word of mouth. But we also pick a ton of houses up from auction. Like we probably pick up 50% of our houses now from auction. And, uh, that's, that really helps us. Okay. So, so you started out and they started out with, uh, you know, the regular bandit signs and cold calling and everything. But so now the real key to your success is the, the Facebook and social media following. And I'm sure you have a good Instagram and you're really active on there, like doing your teaching and all that stuff. So, uh, um, how does somebody kind of get to be, you know, 
grow a social media following for that aspect. You know what I mean? Cause most people don't even know, I mean, they use Facebook, but they don't know how to like get in there and like grow and get followers and make content and all that stuff. So, um, this is probably a loaded question, but how does somebody like start doing that? Like, how does that work? Post your journey, post almost everything. Look, post when you buy the house, post when you're doing the update and maintenance to it, uh, the rehab. Post when you sell it. Post a review from your buyer who bought the house and how much they loved it. Post that stuff and put 50 to 100. If you don't have a lot of money right now, put 50 to $100 behind it and market that locally. Like in ads. Somebody, like, yeah, yeah. In ads. Why not? And just like Facebook ads right now are probably cheap compared to how much it would used to cost you get on TV or the radio. And I would argue more effective, especially when you can circle a little area and say, just hit these people. Yeah. So, so do that and just get, get your Instagram out there and just always be active on social media, whether you hate it or love it. That's where the eyes are now. I, I don't know what else to tell you. If you're not on Instagram and Facebook with your business, I'd hate to say you even exist unless right. you're a huge brand. I, I really would. Yeah, no, definitely. I definitely agree. Um, so let's, let's kind of walk through a deal. Do you have like, Let's walk through the first process, the uh, step-by-step of like one deal. So how does it go? Like you guys are sending, you have Facebook ads out there. People are seeing the ads come across them where you guys are like maybe sending out a couple direct mails or something. What's the first step? They see it and they're like, they'll call in to, uh, do you have a call center or does it go right to one of you guys? How does that look? So we actually have an acquisitions team. Uh, we hired, uh, his name's Blanks, and uh, he actually was hired right before I got there to come in with his B6 team. And Andrew kind of handed over what he was doing because he was our acquisitions. We still find our own properties, but what we'll do, I'll just give you a quick rundown. If we yeah. don't go to auction, this is how we find a house. Yeah. So we'll get a call in, go to our secretary, our office manager, and she'll answer, and then she'll set up Blanks to go do a first look. Blanks kind of knows what we're looking for and has a budget. He goes out there and he kind of gets rid of all the garbage for us. We get a hundred calls. You know, there's probably 10 properties that we actually want to look at. He goes and looks at all of them. Then he, he goes, all right, this one deserves a second look is what we call it. Does it's he go, second, does he, does he like take pictures of each one? And then, or does he kind of have like a checklist in it that he has that says, I'm not going to waste your time with these, or he looks at them all and takes pictures of them all and shows them to you guys and say, Hey, these are the ones we want to look at. Both, uh, both actually. So he quickly works his way through a list of about four possibilities. One, will this be a flippable property? Two, will this be an ANC rent to own property? Three, could the guys just buy this and wholesale it real quickly? Uh, and then the fourth one would be, uh, uh, if I didn't say it already, it'd be a flip. So maybe it's only three possibilities. Uh, but anyway, he goes and evaluates it for that. Now, if it's a flip, we do a second look, flip or wholesale, we go do a second look at the property. So this is if, look, they got the numbers have to be realistic. The owner has to be realistic. The house has to be in a good location. If all that passes and his rough budget passes, because he's not a contractor. My partner, Steve, is a contractor. So he does a rough budget. Steve's taught him how to do that. Then we all go out, all the owners go out and do a second look. This means we're kind of serious. Once we go out there, we do our own budget on it. We evaluate the property and make sure, because at the end of the day, we face the consequences if we buy a wrong house, not blanks. So we evaluate it and we like it. We say, all right, Blanks, this is the offer you need to put in. And if they accept the offer, then we pay Blanks uh, a substantial finder's fee because he, he looks at like 100 houses, so he needs to be paid for his time. Yeah. So we pay Blanks his finder's fee, then Blanks is off of it except for the back end. He'll get like 1% of the uh, net profit. I'm sorry, gross profit. He gets 1% of the gross profit at the end of the deal okay. as well. So it's just something we threw in there for him finding the houses. So they say they accept our deal, then we start it. But what we now need to do is decide which investor we want to put on it. We have about four or five investors that we work with. We have one very large investor. He's been with us since the beginning. He holds about 80% of our properties, has anywhere between three and four million with us at any given time. I'm probably the second largest investor. And then we have about two or three other people that play with their 401k or have about 150, 200k sitting around that they throw in with us at any given time. We figure out who that fits with, send it out, say, do you want to do this house? Sometimes we send it to two of them and see whoever responds first. Then we lock the investor down. They get the deed of trust. We get the keys. We close the house, go in. We start the rehab, rehab it as quickly as we can, obviously, put it up on the market, and then we sell it. And then we have a little bit of back in there where Andrew, what, Andrew's wife, uh, is a realtor. So she gets all of our properties. And in return for that, she kicks back half of her side 
of the of the uh, commission. commission. Oh, okay. And then your partner, you said Steve is a contractor. So then he has his own construction company and I'm sure, do you guys bid it to his construction company? Like it was just a random guy or he, that's in, included. He had his own construction company, but now he is, uh, he's, he's partner and pretty much just project manages all the houses, project manages all the houses. We tried to start our own in-house construction company and it just needed more management than we thought. These guys, <laughs> these guys can be rough. Uh, and Steve can't afford to have three guys at one house and go micromanage them while managing the other 15, 20 projects we have going on at a time. So basically what we do now is hire contractors that can almost project manage their own houses. And we never let them do more than one house at a time until they finished one house completely and did a good job. And then we slowly set them, step them up from now there. Let me give you guys, everybody listen to piece of advice. Never give a contractor, I don't, I don't care almost in any circumstance, more than one house at a time until he proves himself otherwise. Because here's what happens. What happened to us? We yeah. can tell you everything not to do. Yeah. Contractor looks great first three, four weeks in, right? He's killing it. It's to say it's an eight-week project. Halfway through it, he's killing it. Oh, man, this guy's on top of it. He's invoicing on time. He's doing a good job. He's communicative. Give him three more projects. We got three more houses. Give him three more. Now he's got four projects. Now he's overstretched himself because he said yes to all of them because it's a lot of money. Yeah. Contractor's wife breaks up with him. Contractor's wife leaves him. Contractor's best guy quits. Contractor gets on drugs. Contractor disappears. It happens all the time. Yeah. What do we do now? We have four houses in contract with this guy and we've already paid him a little bit of upfront money, not the whole project, of course, on all these. Now we got four projects that are just in limbo because we don't know where this contractor is. Right. Don't do, don't do that. One yeah. at a time, slowly step them way up, let them earn their keep. Uh, no matter how good they say they are, you need to be careful with that. So we try to do one contractor per house if we can, obviously in our area, we got 15, 20 projects. It's hard to do because it's hard to find 15, 20 good contracting crews. Yeah. That's what I was so, going to ask is like, how do you find like doing that? You know what I mean? It's hard. It's hard. So what we do is we keep in the stable, maybe only three or four huge rehabs at a time. These are burnt down houses, full rehabs and the rest have to be almost makeup jobs or just quick projects that, uh, that almost any, not even all contractor crew can handle. We could just pick up a guy that's licensed of course, but just a random guy that could go in there and do the work. All right. Okay. So, um, how come, so what is your guys' standard timeline? Like what do you guys average from the time you like close on a house, to the time you put it back on the market? Do you know that? We shoot six months from the time of purchase till the time it, it's uh, listed. Okay. So that's now, why that's, I, that's a probably overkill on most houses, but yeah. we just shoot, we just tell our investors that give us six, six to eight months to get your money back. So that's why you're always between 15 and 20 houses at a time because six months, twice a year, about right. 30, 40 houses a year. <clears throat> so, um, how much of, how does the investor profit work? Like how much of the profit do you guys get versus how much the investor get? Does, is the investor's profit just a set rate of like eight to 10% return? And then you guys get the rest or how does that, how does that work? So we're in a transition phase right now. So when we first started, like anybody, you need the money the most. Right. I mean, that's, that's one of the most important things is the money. So with the opportunity we had with our largest investor, keep in mind, we probably have one of, if not, the best investors in the world, at least to us, yeah. because he is so lenient. He's let us make mistakes. He, uh, uh, we like to joke, he's got more money than God. And like, because of that, he uh, is very understanding and we've made our mistakes. Look, we just straight up have. And so not many investors would be like, no, you're not going to go. You said you're going to flip it. You can't go rent it now and just take your time getting my money back. Like right. give me my money, most of, especially hard money. They'll just take the house from me. Right. He was like, whatever. He, we get a lot, a lot of times we don't even get an email back. He's just like, whatever, just do, just do it. He doesn't even look at the investments anymore. He hasn't, yeah. seen, he hasn't seen an investment that he's invested on in probably two years. That must be nice. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> so he just, he just trusts us because he knows, and we've shown this, that we will get him all of his money back no matter what. Right. No matter what, we are going to make you whole again. We might not get you profit on the deal. Uh, we usually, 98% of the time we do, but we always make you whole. And I don't know many companies that can promise that. And we right. promise that for him because he's been with us for, since the beginning. So for him and for me, because I also started early, it's one third of the profit share to the investor. So if it's a $30,000 gross profit, 
the investor gets 10,000, the company gets 20. Okay. But recently we have started doing eight to 10%, 8% to anybody that loans us less than 100K and 10% to anybody 100K and over. And we just pay you that monthly on your monthly payout on your money and then we'll get your money back in six to eight months. Yeah. Okay. Like I said, eight, eight to 10% annual return. Right. Annualized. Right. Okay, cool. Um, so, uh, what was, where was I going with this? Oh yeah. So what makes you guys want to stick with flipping? Is it maybe just in your market as opposed to wholesaling? Is it because a lot of the houses you guys are getting are really torn up houses that you could never just turn around to sell or just because like the time frame so long, like six months, um, to like turn the money around a lot of people think you know oh, let me just wholesale or wholetail it and uh you can get a smaller return but the opportunity cost is um lower the lost opportunity cost you know what i mean so w- what's your guys' uh philosophy around that so we're wholetailing a lot more like a lot more i'd probably say we're trying to get that to like probably 60 or 70 percent of our business now we were buying anything and everything before uh, and that's when I kind of came in and I, and I was like, I could just see it from a different angle. I will say better, just a different angle that helped us. I said, look, you got to push your profit margins higher because what it was, what they were, they were kind of looking at and it wasn't wrong then, I guess. Uh, it was just, they're looking at it differently than I would have. They were just like, as long as we can make at least $15,000 on the project, we'll buy it. Like that just our minimum. And I said, guys, you can't look at it that way. So if that project takes three months and this one takes nine months, the 15,000 means something completely different, right. especially for the amount of work and amount of time. So what we've done is we pushed our margins. Well, now it's, we're at a minimum of $22,000 per house. And then, then even then, if it gets into the, the higher investment, the 150 to $200,000, $300,000, it goes even higher. Uh, all the way up to $50,000 minimum margin if we do that. So I, I'm kind of getting off basic of what, basis of what you asked here, but we've stuck with flipping uh, because it's kind of what we were doing and we're going to start kicking ourselves a little bit. We kind of got ourselves into a situation where we need the flip right now because we need the capital, but we are going to wish and our 50 and 60 year old selves are probably going to kick us ourselves in the butt that we should have bought more holding, holding uh, properties. Yeah. Uh, we haven't went back to our biggest investor yet, but we almost think that he would finance a lot of these deals for us at six to 8% indefinitely. Right. Like we think we think that uh, we think that he would. Uh, so we're going to start looking for that. And yes, like if I had to give advice to somebody, flip to build up some capital, mm-hmm. and then quickly get out of that. Now you have to get out of it, but do both. Get some holding too. Let you know, let other people pay off your assets and build those down the road. Uh, and that's something we are going. Twenty twenty is going to bring a lot more of that. Okay. Yeah. And that, that kind of moves me to the next uh, thing that I was going to ask, but before we move to that, um, yeah, no, I definitely think that's, that's the way to go, especially. So in your market, what is, you, you might know this, what is like the average cost of the average cost of a single family home in your guys' market? About 120 to 150. 120, 150. And the average rent, what is that for that same house? Maybe 800 to 800 to a thousand, depending on how nice the house is. 800 to, 800 to a thousand. So that's like the ARV cost price is like 120 to 150, but you guys are getting these houses for much lower price than that. So really, if you could be into a house, you know, for 70 or 80 grand, I mean, your you know, your, your cash flow on that could be several hundred dollars a month. Um, and it'd be an updated house, your CapEx and your overhead and all the expenses and everything's lower. Um, so well, we have one right now. I'll give you an example. So we went in and just wholetailed this thing. It was an A-frame house. It was beautiful. The only thing, the only hiccup with this was somebody was living in it when we got it at auction. Be careful of that. We don't, we calculate for it, but if you're new to this and you're paying hard money, you've got to be careful because it took almost three months to get him out of there. He was hard-headed, didn't want to leave. We had to get the cops. It's a, it was a fiasco. Luckily, anyway, in West Virginia and not California. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> West Virginia is the, the, the most lenient. Uh, for landlords, you're really strict, right? Oh, it's yeah. To, <laughs> it could be a year, you know? <laughs> oh, man. So if you have hard money, that kills you. It yeah. Really kill you. So what we did was, uh, of course, hard money would be hard to get for an auction because of how fast you need it. But anyway, just be careful of that. But we picked this house up. We're all in it for about 70. We just sold it. This is one of my investments. I'm all in it for about 70. Sold it for 139 in a few days. So it's a very good. It's very yeah. good. But 
let's, let's go back and just say that I didn't buy this through the company. I bought it myself and did this myself. It rent for probably 1200. So a mortgage on 70 grand. Yeah. Mortgage on 70 grand is only like, I don't know, 400 bucks a month. It'd be the gift that keeps on giving. Now I'm going to make, I'm going to make myself about $18,000 profit to me. Uh, That's my, that's my one third share on 70 in about five months, which is really Great. good too yeah. now, but I got to pay the taxes on it right now. I don't get all the read off write offs and all that. That's one thing I tell people. He's like, if I'm gonna give you 18 grand, are you going to complain about the taxes or not? It's like, yeah. just you want the 18 grand or not? Like, yeah, yes, there's better ways always. Yeah. But it's still right. 18 grand to me. And if I have to give up four or five of that, it's still yeah. a good, good return. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing is a lot of people listening, uh, they, somebody that's new or not even new, just like it's where you're at in your life. What do you want more? You know what I mean? What do you need more? You need more capital? Then yes, you can continue to do this and do your flipping and wholesaling and wholesaling and everything and build that capital. But once you get to a point like you guys are, you guys are what, you know, doing good. You, you got some money. Then it's a good time because then you could, you know, cash out, refinance that thing, lower your, your cash on or your cash flow a little bit, but you get most of your money back. You don't pay taxes on the refinance or whatever. So Again, millions of different things, ways to do uh, real estate investing. You know, I'm so. being an idiot personally. I, I, and I say that to myself because the company needs the capital right now yeah. for, for, for uh, how we're set up currently. But I, 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 in my area, I don't need, my wife and I don't need any more capital. Not that we're like balling. We just don't need any more cash. Yeah. I, need, I should be buying rentals. And in fact, 2020, we've kind of talked about this just the other night. We started looking at some multifamilies and we need to make a move in that direction. It's just a little awkward buying stuff outside of the company. Uh, my partners don't care. I just feel a little awkward about it yeah. because who should buy it? The company or me or, or well, both? I don't, it's well, maybe there's a way, you know, maybe you could be buying these houses discounted from your company. You know, nope. like there's a spread to where your company still makes cash flow. You still get a rental at a reduced price. Then you guys are both winning or something. We, 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 we thought about that. And then I get to at least double dip a little bit. Let's say we picked up a house for 50 mm-hmm. and say it regularly, we'd wholesale it for 70. Like if it was a wholesale, they, we all agree to give it to me for 60 and yeah. the company makes 10 and I get it for less than any other investor. Uh, but it's just, um, I don't know. It's a, it's a little tricky because I also help find these houses. So yeah. it's a little hard. It's a little hard for me to give the 10 up to the company, even though, <laughs> even though 3,300 of it would come back to me in, in a roundabout way, it's, yeah. it's still, well, it's, it's whatever. I always tell people, don't listen to that because I tell people not to listen. Don't get hung up on what you pay somebody else for it as long as the numbers work for you. Right. No, that's definitely true. I, I've been guilty of that myself. Like, yeah. but they got it for this price and whatever. That doesn't matter. As long as it works for me, that works for me. I always um, use this example. If somebody was going to give you a brand new Ferrari for $100,000, or no, let's go cheaper, $50,000, and they pay ten grand for it, are you still buying it? Oh, of course I'd buy it. <laughs> Heck yeah. even, if you sell, even if you sell it again, you're buying it for 50 grand. Right. No, definitely. <laughs> That's true. Cool. So you alluded to it a second ago. Where are you headed from now? Like what's the future of your company look and then like your own personal investing strategy? You kind of mentioned it. So if you want to get into it. <laughs> my wife, I, it gives me anxiety and I'll tell you why real quick. <laughs> My wife graduates in uh, five months, six months. And remember, we didn't come here to stay. And now right. all of a sudden I own a gym here. We didn't even touch on that, but I own a gym here. I have my own consulting business. I help that with other businesses with that. We have ANC properties. We have Montana Construction. We have AM Investments. We built so much here. Um, but our leases, we, we rented here because my wife uh, got student housing. We pay $500 a month in a brand new apartment. We weren't passing that up. Yeah. And I could put our cash to work in this investment. But five months from now, this is six, sorry, she graduates in five and a half months and six and a half months we have to be out of here. Uh, Cause it can't, she's not a student anymore. I have no idea. We have no idea. Cause our initial plan was come here. She gets her doctorates. She, we paid for her school in cash. We have zero debt anywhere. We haven't had debt in 10 years. We paid her everything in cash. So she's going to graduate making about $180,000 to $200,000 a year, depending on where she goes and works. We come out to where you're at. She might make two fifteen. dollars That's in right. fact, we wanted to go to California, but also California pays the most. If, yeah, but don't come here. It, <laughs> it sucks. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, the weather doesn't. The weather's beautiful. <laughs> right. So that, that's huge for both of us. But anyway, uh, we also have a little foster baby now. So we started fostering here. And so we got a little foster girl. 
uh, just a, month, a little month, over a month ago, and we don't know what's happening with that. We foster animals as well here, so we're really close with the shelter. We just put a lot of anchors down unintentionally, and we have to make a decision in six and a half months. Is it stay in Charleston, West Virginia, and I stay with my partners and doing what we're doing, or do we stick to our original plan and travel nurse anesthesia is what the original plan was, where she makes a substantially more income than she was as a nurse, and we move around. The trick with that is I can't be bored again. I was, I was depressed in Maui. When I, I tell imagine. people that, they were like, what? I was like, I went from being the guy, always busy, and people calling me, to nobody needing me. I wasn't. I was financially fine. But it didn't matter when my wife went off to work three days a week for 12 hours. Those are the worst three 12-hour shifts in my life. Because one, I felt like she was working and I wasn't contributing. Two, my phone wasn't ringing anymore. And I was just lost. I had a great time in Maui. It was beautiful. I'm not going to say it was miserable. But half of the week sometimes, I was like sad. I, you know, I totally know what you're talking about, especially go-getters of people like you, you know what I mean? You got to be doing something. So, well, that's a predicament for sure. Um, but as far as the company goes though, they're, they're kind of still planning and you're going to still be kind of partners in your business and everything. So, um, as far as that goes, what do you think, what do you, what is the company planning regardless, regardless whether or not John Schuller's there, what are they planning on doing? We are going to continue flipping. We're going to continue the flipping, but we're going to look to start vertical integration a little bit more. We're going to try to bring the construction company back again. We're going to bring in a, our next hire is a uh, project manager full time. And they're, they're a little bit expensive, especially if you're going to manage 20, 30 houses. But we figured we just met, met we just work them in the budget of the house. $500, $1,000 per house should cover a decent salary, $50,000, $60,000 for the project manager to come in. Now Steve will be a little bit more free. Not for the first few months because you got to baby this guy and make sure he's good. Or a girl, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> don't want to be sexist here. Yeah. But baby and make Not sure that binary. they're good. <laughs> Any of it, right? I don't yeah. care what bathroom you use as long as, yeah. you're, as, long as you can manage the houses. <laughs> and then, then, uh, then Steve will have a little bit more free time because you kind of start the construction company back up. And now we can kind of keep that money in-house for when we flip these houses. Then we want to start getting into a little bit more rentals. But we also want to start getting into our commercial. So the bigger paychecks for us here will be com flipping commercial properties. Uh, we have the money to do it. We have access to the money to do it. We just need to learn the market a little bit more. Fortunately, the person we get the money from owns just about any, he's got businesses in Dubai, in China, and wow. uh, Kazakh, K Kazakhstan. I don't know if I'm saying it right. Kazakhstan? Kazakhstan. One of, the, one of <laughs> yeah. those. His business there, he's got businesses in Europe, car dealerships, all over the He's like, he's, That's he's crazy. got a lot. Yeah. And all of his businesses are debt free. Learn so from that guy. Him, yes. So we, we just were at lunch with him the other day. <clears throat> I actually took a pictures of his shoes. Because like, <clears throat> his shoes have holes in them. And you would never know. Like, a, lot of those, <laughs> a lot of these guys are like that. And I said, I said, quit, I put it on my Instagram. It's just a picture of his shoe. And I put it on my Instagram or Snapchat. And I said, don't judge a book by its cover. Because yeah. you have no idea. So he does a lot of commercial here. And I know he would, I know he would just kind of teach us the game. Oh yeah. Uh, so we want to start doing more of that, but our goal is to get those, get away from the 15 to $30,000 checks and get into the six figure checks. Um, and we'll work our way up. I'll be happy with an $80,000 check, oh, but I want, to start, I want to start moving into six figure checks and just move a little bit faster in that department. Yeah, no, that sounds awesome. I think the perfect person for you to look at or, uh, is I interviewed him. He's going to be coming out. His episode's going to be airing just before years. His name's Clint Bartlett and they're up in Omaha, Nebraska. And he's partners with uh, Jeff Cohn. Jeff Cohn's kind of well known as he's the largest Berkshire Hathaway team in the country mm -hmm. or the world of real estate. And then they also have this wholesaling company and I think they have 70 rentals and they, they uh, wholesale or flip a hundred houses a year. And they're trying to move that up to like, you know, 50 houses a month is or whatever they're, wow. they're going towards, you know, but kind of the same thing it, it'd be a good person for you to talk to you know because i mean they're doing the same thing you're just talking about just a, a couple years ahead of you you know that's so it, that, that's fine that's that's who we want to follow yeah heck yeah so well that's cool that all sounds good uh i'm i hope you can figure a way to um please your wife at the same time of running your companies because you don't want to give up on that but i'm sure there's a way you can do it from a distance and make it well, that's the problem she's indifferent too oh okay she, she's in, she's indifferent she she doesn't know what to do. Right. Because, I mean, it's uh, hard. Now, if we had the foster girl, if she's still with us, obviously we're not going to leave her up and leave her. 
Yeah. So that would be a, that would be a uh, situation that kind of sticks us here. So we would either, one thing we're looking to do real quick to add on, we're looking to buy a multifamily place to live in uh-huh. and just house, house hack it. So yeah. if we have to, if we, we don't have to stay and we don't have to, we can extend it. So we stay another six months. We just house hack this thing. We live for free. Yeah. And then if we leave, we just rent it out. Yeah, no, definitely. That's cool. That's good. I, or, and buy a private jet when you go. So then you can just like jet back real quick. You know what I mean? <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> All right, sweet. So, um, where is your to the next to the last section here that I kind of always talk about is like, what is a favorite resource for you to like learn about whether it's business or real estate or um, anything? What's your favorite resource for learning that type of stuff? Website or podcast, uh, s- seminars, books? What is yours? The Justin Hanna podcast. Of That's course. it, man. <laughs> All right, good. Uh, episode done. Click. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, podcasts like yours, uh, and then bigger pockets. I know it's a generic answer, but I mean, it is what it is. They probably have the biggest library of content you could possibly get on the, on the subject, especially when it comes to podcasts, you know, books, uh, but not too much of any of it because that's, I got stuck in this. I think a lot of people get in this, that, that procrastination stage or where they just keep trying to learn. If I just read one more book, I'll, I'll flip out. If I just watch one more podcast. Watch maybe 10 podcasts and read maybe five books right. and then start doing something, right? Uh, I don't care what it is. If it's talking to an investor, get out and do something uh, because that won't, but only do so much for you. Do that too. But just limit yourself. Yeah, no, definitely. Cool. Right on. So, and then what about a favorite app? Is there an app or some type of, type of program that you guys use in your business that's uh, really like key to your success? Basecamp. So Basecamp, Basecamp, yeah. So Basecamp was huge. Uh, if you guys have like a decent sized company, you can start this. If you're a one person company, you should start reading it to learn how to build it. But start with the book Traction. Oh yeah, it's, really, it's, it's excellent. We actually have uh, pretty much uh, built our entire system in our company around Traction. It's not, uh, it's not perfect. It's not a uh, word for word, but we have the meetings. We have the structured quarterly meetings. We have our um, goals. We have all that stuff and we, we do it kind of by the book. So traction is huge. If you're going to build up, build a company. And then we got a, an app to keep us on schedule. It's called Basecamp, And, uh, it's kind of like Monday, or if you have any of these other apps, it's a scheduling app, but we can assign different people in our company roles, to do list, checklist, when it should be done, if it's overdue. And then if anything becomes overdue on our Monday morning meetings, we go, why is this overdue? And what's the new date for it? And then it just keeps everybody on schedule and uh, keep all of our lockbox codes in there. It's just an organizational app. Cool. Right on. Um, what about uh, influencer? I know you're, you're on social media and you're, but you don't like, I'm, I'm sure you don't like browse social media all the time, but is there somebody in uh, social media that you kind of look after that gives a lot of like real, real world knowledge or motivation? Yeah. If you're going to stick to a real estate dabbling, don't go with everything, but dabble in a little Grant Cardone, you know, just kind of, kind of, he's good motivation and just kind of like saying, just do it. And I like that. He's, he's not, he's not so much down to earth anymore. And and definitely what he says doesn't work for everybody because it's easier to say these things when you have a few hundred million dollars, but, but listen to him. Uh, Gary V of course, I like him for some business advice and just kind of like what he preaches about being kind in business and always doing the right thing. And then I really like Ed Milet a lot. Uh, I'm debt free myself. I won't always be that way. I'll start leveraging bank money, but I think almost everything Ed Milet owns, he's debt free. Dave Ramsey, if you don't know how to save money, listen to the good dude, whether you're religious or not or whatever, just listen to his financial advice, especially if you're just starting out. Now he says never leverage money. I don't believe in that, but definitely learn how to respect and control money first before starting to leverage it. You suck with money now. You're gonna suck with other people's money too. So yeah. don't do don't do that because other people are gonna want their money back. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. Cool, man. Right on. Where can people find out more about Mr. John Scholler? So my Instagram and YouTube, John Scholler, just my name. You can find me on there. Don't get it confused with my. I, I'm a photographer as well, and I have a Shots by Scholler Instagram account uh, from where we travel and stuff. But my John Scholler account, you'll see a picture of me with my JS shirt on. Uh, as the profile image and then on YouTube as well. I'm the only John Scholler on there and I give a ton of information on both of those. Accounts. That's S-C-H-O-L-E-R? S-C-H-O-E-L-L-E-R. Okay. 
Okay. Well, perfect. Well, John, I appreciate you being on. That was lots of great information, a good story, motivational and knowledgeable at the same time. So I appreciate it, man. And uh, I will keep in contact and talk to you soon. Awesome, Justin. Thank you so much for having me on. Thanks, man.